Welcome to the Microsoft Security Insights Podcast with your hosts, Franklin Grimberg and Edward Walton, where we discuss Microsoft 365 security and Azure security news and products. Recorded April 20th, 2022. <laughs> Good evening, Brody. Good evening, Ra. Good evening, Frank. How are you guys doing? Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Yeah, super, we got a super excellent. How's that song go? I don't know. I'm super. Thanks for asking. No, from the Lego movie. Somebody said, Oh, it. Play, that's play, in my play. head now. Thanks. Oh, I remember that? oh my goodness. Yeah. It's going to be stuck yeah. in my head now. Lego movie I, song. I, 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 I don't remember. Hey, we got a good guest on. This is our first time to all of our listeners, watchers, supporters, and everybody else that listens to us just banter on as though we experts. We are on the Microsoft Reactor channel. Uh, we're trying to spread the goodness that is Microsoft security, uh, entertain you. Hopefully, we do some knowledge transfer. You generate good questions. We go out and find answers and just do stuff. We have a um, esteemed guest. He's a re- uh, returning uh, guest on the show, uh, Mr. Matt Sosman. And we're going to get into some, some really, really good topics and talk about what Matt's been doing what is important on the, in the world of security and a few other things. But before we get started, Frank, you do anything interesting this week? You know, I like to say that the chat is already active and they're letting me know that the song is Everything is Awesome. So uh, everything is awesome. Uh, hey, uh, that's what it is. <laughs> everything is awesome. Yeah. Um, tell me, Frank, would you, you do anything? I haven't talked to you in a minute. You, you, you all right? I was still working on SC200. Uh, that's really about it. I did renew my MS500 uh, and AZ500 search through Learn. Um, and the next day, I got a little thing that said, hey, you need to renew your certification. So it looks like I get to do it all over again. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> um, so it's going down the Edward path on the uh, certification side just, there. Just don't and, do oh, like Brody and forget to do it. Well, what he should do what happened? is open a ticket. <laughs> oh no! I learned from you. No way am I opening a ticket. You open a ticket, uh, and you uh, you 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 surely upset the wrong person, and have your entire MCP history erased from 1998. I would. Like I got a good story. And give me your credit card. And give me your credit card number, social security number, and your you know the last three residences you stayed at, and stuff like that, right? So the other thing is that uh, I was excited to see that this week we have another name uh, rebranding. So, Mr. Purview is here today, Brody Castle. <laughs> Mr. Purview. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. quite the, rena- the brand renaming. Yeah, or consolidation, I suppose, of all of the goodness and information protection, compliance, et cetera. Yeah, there's a, there's a whole chart on it. I'm going to have to refer to it a few times. So, we'll put that we'll put that in the show notes. Rod, you want to add to that? Go yeah, ahead. we'll have to. A um, couple people. I think it was Frank that said he hated me for the rebranding. Hated me. I don't know why he said that. but. Um, I was That's delivering a session on Microsoft Sentinel to a user group yesterday, Iowa, Microsoft, Azure, user group, whatever. Um, and they were talking about the rebranding because as part of that, you know, obviously we talk about Defender for Cloud and all that good kind of stuff. And they were talking about that and uh, how upset they get when that stuff happens. And I said, well, by the time I'm done, two hours after I finish my time with you today, we're going to have another rebranding. I can't tell you what it is, but at least I won't be talking mm. to you. Microsoft Purview Sentinel. Is that what it's called now? You need Defender to put up Purview. a screenshot for that. Uh, uh, for that. So I, do me a favor. I've heard you say Purview five times really fast. I'm Purview about times you. five really fast. You're going to use this in some sort of audio <laughs> clip, but Purview, 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 Purview. There you That's go. Right. Very well. good. See, I thought that that was like the the uh, the requirement for Microsoft rebranding, trying to say the name five times in a row. If it doesn't work out, then it's a good name. So I could Purview. never say that five times uh, in a row. So <laughs> I'm glad I passed your test or our test. I, yeah. When I saw the actual old names versus rebranding names, like this could be a test question. <laughs> on the exam to try to map them right to see which one goes to what yeah. um yeah and i'm I, no I, longer writing test questions so i'm excited to see that i don't have to deal with this renaming of any exam questions so <laughs> yeah you got, you got a good point i um i i saw the you mirror what you did this week uh franklin i renewed my ms 500 az 500 and i did something else so i wouldn't be the last person to do it 
I actually set the beta exam for SC100. Good job. Nice. nice. How'd you feel about it? Um, I think, like I told you, Rod, 60-40, 60 yes, 40 no. It's, it's, it's a fair exam. Um, it, it wasn't any trickery questions, and I liked it if you really read the stuff that says. Yeah. Some of them may have no right answers, and some of them maybe have multiple answers, and some of them may be partial. I, I like the way it, it sort of emulates real world to say, let's go down this route. But even if you don't get to the 100% completion, you're still on the right path to get the right answer to help the customer. You're really looking yeah. at it from an architectural uh, perspective, not task oriented. Yeah. It, 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 it was a good exam. It, uh, it made me think. I seem to always get a bad draw on questions about stuff I absolutely know nothing about, but those are the exams I do the best on. Stuff that I think I'm an expert in, I score like a negative two. <laughs> like, are you, <laughs> like, are you even in security, right? <laughs> it's like, you know, um, so I did that and um, I've been actually reading a lot more on Git. I've been happy to go back and relearn stuff and uh, from the bad way I learned it. So I started like <laughs> getting Git for dummies actually a really good book and blew through that uh and then um rod and i have sort of he i asked for help he gave me something and i'm running with it we'll probably talk about it on another show where i'm trying to write a solution that can monitor the health of individual tables in sentinel well so not the tables it. but the individual endpoints in the table I have to solve it for both sides because the oh. endpoints are fine. It is just that when something happens to that collector and when you get to that, that table looks healthy. But if it was looking for five data sources that are feeding that table and only four showing up, but you don't have an actual failure of the security source, like a firewall or proxy or something, that table looks healthy. So we're experimenting with a few things, man, to try to figure out. I know. I, I've, I've reached around people. Oh, you can do it on volume size. I, I, you can't expect the volume to be the same. I mean, your volume is up here and then on the weekends and then you have holidays. So, you know, what if the volume changes because you add another firewall, a branch firewall or something? Right. I think I got it. I'm going to write that and uh, something else that Rod and I figured out. There isn't a documented high availability for the law collector. I'm sorry. Yeah, for the law collector. And there isn't really a true high availability solution for Sentinel across geographic regions. Without paying double. <laughs> well, yeah. It, that's, that's the thing. Right? It's, it's double, right? Yeah. That's uh, kind of it's kind of worth the worth the price. If you're worried about an Azure region going down, then yeah, it's worth the price, I think. Yeah. Well, and you yes. pay double if you had on-prem disk anyway for a solution, right? So if you had, you, know, you and I talked about it, yeah, 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 <laughs> right. Yeah, so that's been that. It's it's actually challenging, and plus I, you know, I like to spend money on stuff. Every time I talk to Rod, I, it costs me a thousand dollars. Every time I talk to Rod, I mean, he's like, oh, I got this, I got this new shiny thing, in. I was like, I want the shiny thing, I want the shiny thing too, so I go buy it. But the yeah. things that I did buy. Because yeah. I was working with some of the federal team, and everybody in the agency always have their purple team field, uh, field manual, the red team field manual, and the blue team field manual. I highly recommend these books. They're sort of like cheat sheets on commands and all type of stuff. I, I, you know, maybe we'll buy it and have a raffle for some of our listeners and give it to them. Best uh, ninety bucks I spent for three books, and convince Rod to get it. There you go. Yeah, I got it on my tablet that Ed just bought. So yeah, I just I didn't buy his tablet. He convinced me to go buy a tablet. And this thing, my my wife goes, "What did you just spend eight hundred dollars on?" I said, well, I, I I didn't spend eight hundred dollars. Yes, you did. Right. I said, no, I spent eight hundred twenty-seven dollars and fourteen cents. I made a good business case. They made a good well, business case, right? Right. So now, now I know why you want to talk to Edward. That's great. You've made it yeah. profitable for yourself. That's Brody, what yeah. do you what do you do this week, man? You know, this week, oh, what happened this week? What happened this week? I'm working with some customers on securing guest access into their environments, mm -hmm. um, some more insider risk management, which is a cool, which is a cool feature. Now part of Purview. Uh, <laughs> what else? Um, yeah, it's uh, ongoing Defender for Endpoint work, Defender for Identity work. So it's, it's Q4, it's super busy, uh, which is fun. But I also... 
Uh, I'm also now a co-lead of the America's Time Zone Security Community. I got nominated by some wonderful people, Paul Navarro and Tu Tran. Uh, so a couple That's people are, cool. are have been in that position for a few yeah. years now. And yeah, thank you. And and so yeah. they reached out, and and I'm like, yeah, absolutely, I'd love to do this. It sounds like a lot of fun. And so we're they're like, yeah, we wanted to grow a lot of interest and build a community especially in latin america but then we're like oh yeah canada well now we've got a canadian mm, and yeah. uh, so now we'll get full you know vertical uh representation in the time zone area which is great because we've got some and ask you some folks i want to reach out to to come on the podcast we've got some some uh, gems up here up north right up in mm? the snowy north yeah. tundra that is canada so yeah look yeah that's that's what's new with me go ahead rod it was well, that word just trying to figure this out. Is that where you like stand on the date line? You make sure that nobody can go back or forth. Yeah. Well, we, we outsource now uh, for the polar bears, right? Because, oh. you know, it's just easier that way. They, you know, they cost less and they're more aggressive. Uh, yeah. So it makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Totally yeah. off the rails. I have no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> like, it, 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 it makes it, two it, of us sad. I know. I'm like, <laughs> All right, I, I get it. I did. You did mention MDI, and I did do some interesting MDI work today. And I'll share maybe on the next podcast when we go. We don't want to consume the time, but um, I did hear a quote, which is it sort of bowed me up to let us know that we're doing good work. We tend to give out a lot of information that's relevant, and Matt Sosman being one of these guys, I can easily follow his stuff and translate it and 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 make it valuable rather than someone just talking to me. But I let him give his own shine. But I heard this yesterday. He said, when someone asks you for help and you just send them a link to the Microsoft Docs, that's just like saying someone asking you for an answer and you hand them a dictionary and say the answer's in there. <laughs> give them something, give them something yeah. that they, they can immediately pivot to that yeah. pulls them on because you just read through the docs. It's, the answer probably is in there. But is that the very last, you know how it is, it the very last thing you read, right? What's what's the what's the, the immutable law? Whatever you're looking for is in the last place you, you yeah. look for it. Yeah, yeah. You find his last place you look, right? And, uh, and and so I love referencing Rod Trent's, Matt Sosman, Jeremy Wimmeller, and a bunch of other folks because and, and a lot of MVPs because it, their stuff is this is how it is and this is how you do it rather than this is this is theoretically how it should work. So, oh, but the MDI yeah. stuff I, I did today was pretty interesting. I learned something. Customers can always teach you something. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what did you learn? Well, I'm going to save it. We want to eat it all up on this podcast. See, okay. You don't that's save fair. for a rainy day, Brody. That's the, that's your thing. Okay. You know, folks, wanna, you want it right now. But <laughs> without further ado, uh, unless right. Frank or somebody else has yeah. some more questions. Um, Oh, one other thing. Brody and I came to a gentleman's agreement that we're going to put off the AZ-104 test until August. Uh, we need to vote on that. Sorry. You don't get a vote because you're not vote? writing it. Yeah. I, 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 I guess Rod was under the impression that this is a democracy. Yeah. <laughs> this, I, this is not that. This is, this is hey, we, we voluntold you. We made a decision for you in your absence. Right? Uh, we're just busy. I'm getting ready to travel. I'm going to be out of the country for a while. Uh, we got this director thing. We're trying to. We got a lot of stuff going on. I really haven't put my mind to the studying piece. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm going to be sitting on my hands. I just that 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 exam is not for the faint of heart, right? It is much harder than the 532 exam, which was the first rendition of it. Uh, 7532, maybe that's the real real old one. Uh, and I'm going through the learn stuff. I'm like, okay, it, there is a difference for being a security guy that works in the cloud than a cloud person that works in security. It's a totally different thing, right? But we'll you push know, it off. Our, 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 our highest uh, viewed shows are the results, though. So, you know, that yeah. Out. Well, we'll, uh, we'll we'll find an easy exam. I, I You know, exam, easy being relative, right? I, yeah. I, All right, so you guys are on to the AZ-900 first and then the AZ-104, you're saying. I've already <laughs> taken it. I've already taken AZ-900. <laughs> I haven't actually. And and I, let my, I had my 104 and I let it lapse, and I was I was just sad. I shouldn't have done it. But uh, but the, the 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 nice weather window up here in the Great White North is quite it's quite small. So I wouldn't let, I wouldn't want to study over the course of spring and summer. I gotta get out there. I got my golf swing. Like I'm actually hitting the ball really good this year. I gotta get into it. You know, and of course I did say gentlemen's agreement. I, I say that we leave it up to the community in our Discord. We'll leave it to the community. Let the community vote because. Yeah. Um, they're pretty I'm, nice. I, 
I guess last week or either uh Rod's boss, like man, I listen to your podcast. I love the banter and I love the certification exam contest all the time. Then he said, How come Frank and Rod are never in the contest? I don't know. Yeah. They already well, have all Frank's, the exams. Frank's done. void, and I, I literally have every certification there is. So okay, okay. You well, gotta hey. go that, you gotta go for that power platform one there, Rod. You're oh, right, up. right, right. Power platform, because yeah, that's that's the next big thing. So Let's go ahead and get our guest on. And and, and he, and Matt hasn't been on the show in a while, but he's, this should have reminded him what we do for the first, you know, ten to fifteen minutes. We, we do this stuff. So, to our listeners and to our guests and viewers and everything, we'd like to introduce or reintroduce Matt Sosman. Matt, can I call you Matt? Or is you it can Matt call here? me Matt. Right. That's fine. You so I used to work. Needs an introduction. Come on, everybody knows Matt. Matt. Come on. Well, Matt is a uh, security uh, guru extraordinaire. Uh, he and I used to work on the same team at Microsoft a while back. I interviewed Matt. I threw him Easter egg questions like, how do you spell Microsoft? How do you spell AIP? You yep. know, what's the last letter in M36? Yep. And Matt's like six. I'm like, oh, <laughs> Matt, come on. <laughs> but no, he's 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 super stoked. He, he, he definitely jump-started the team that we on and instrumental when we were on the same team on the partner side creating the trifecta partner certification and which validated and they took over at microsoft everywhere right everybody at microsoft was saying it right so without that matt i'd like you to do an introduction of yourself i can't do you justice the floor is yours sir well first off thanks for having me it's always a pleasure to come back i think last time we did this it's well over a year ago but uh, great to be back great to see everybody uh, I see all the warm welcomes here in the comments, so thanks for that. Um, been at Microsoft 10 years, uh, been in multiple roles throughout that that time period. You know, was a consultant in MCS, out there deploying these great security products. And before that, I was doing unified communications. I went over to uh, our one commercial partner team where I met Ed and uh, worked with our, our partners as a security architect. And then recently I moved over to our Azure Active Directory engineering team and I'm working with uh, with our partners, but I'm also helping to figure out our, our zero trust strategy for driving integrations across basically all of our security products with our partners. And then I can talk a lot more about that, but lots of interesting stuff. And uh, man, I, I, I love this company. I love this job and I love the tech. So love to talk about it. But love thanks it. for having me. You sent us a little bit of a dossier about the things you want to cover, uh, passwordless uh, communication. Sure zero trusts and I, uh the last thing i wrote down i can't read my own handwriting uh you had a third topic you wanted to go i'll let you do it in any order that you want to go in i think like zero trust is the thing uh, yep. that is the buzzword that you know i think sometimes when we hear it within the, the ecosystem of microsoft there may be a misconception that zero trust was a uh, initiative created by microsoft but it wasn't it, it has been an industry conception for a long time it was just the way that security vendors wanted to approach it. So if you want to start off with that and move to the other sure. topics, the order is yours, whichever way you want to go. Yeah, yeah. Let's And let's make it a conversation. I mean, we could probably spend all day talking about this stuff, right? There's so much to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you're you're right. Zero Trust, it's been around for a while. Uh, the, the backstory on it is actually came out of the Jericho Forum, which is part of the open group. This was, uh, this was like circa 2007. Um, and right around that time period, Google started talking about uh, Beyond Corp. And those kind of kind of came to a point and we started seeing out, out in the industry the term zero trust. And you know, it kind of depends on, on who you talk to. Different people have different definitions. But you know, broadly when you look at it, it's it's around some core principles, right? Now, now for Microsoft, the, the principles we think about and and even NIST will will think about this as well in their guidance is it really comes down to kind of three core principles. You verify explicitly. You know, let's make sure it's really, you know, Edward coming through the front door and not not Brody, right? That's trying to impersonate him. Which I uh, Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, the second one is let's make sure that uh, the user has least privilege. Now that also includes an admin, which we could talk about because that gets super interesting when we start to restrict IT admins. And not give them, you know, God mode, right, and, and full administrative permissions. 
So use, using least privilege, and there's a lot that comes along with that. And the third one, and kind of my favorite, and you know what what Rod's been working on around with Sentinel is assume breach. So let's let's have this mindset that the attacker is already in the bank. How do we get the attacker to not leave the bank, and how do we go find them? Right. And that so, just makes sense. Yeah. Like when you think about that old castle moat style, trusted, yeah. untrusted. It just you, you you have to sit back and realize it's not if it's when a breach occurs. Yeah. You need mm-hmm. to be ready for it, and your perimeter isn't as secure as you think it is. Unfortunately, yeah. right. And it's not fud. It's just reality. There's right the. the, the Team offense just has an advantage, right? That's just, yeah. just the name of the game. Yeah. Team offense has an advantage. So right. and I think I think some of the misconception too is that this zero trust thing. If you apply these policies, then you you don't have to monitor anymore. You're set up for best practices, but you still have to continually verify that everything is in place. So yeah, and out of the products yeah. that are part of the M365 security stack, the product that most closely is in line with assume breaches MDI. Microsoft Defender for Identity. That's one of the products that doesn't have the most sex appeal. You don't want to hear anything from it at all. Exactly. You're, going, you're going to have a bad day if you start hearing from it, right? And so, but uh, you said one thing, Matt, before we continue. You said yeah. we referenced zero trust at Microsoft against the NIST framework, but which one? 800 53, 171, CFS, CSF, which one? So, no. so if you look at 800 207, 207, that's that's where we that's where 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 Microsoft and this kind of align, if you will, and and without going too deep on it, maybe that's another episode here. But 800 207 is where we talk about a zero trust architecture, and then adopting basically those three core principles in the zero trust architecture, and and things things start to get pretty interesting at that point, um, and, and and the reason why they get interesting is. It kind of depends on who you are. You know, in the IT world, you've got the network people and you got the application people. And I guess you kind of argue you have the data people too, right? Um, you know, back in my day, the, the network people were always blaming the apps people and the apps people were always blaming the network people. But I, I digress. So, so when you think about zero trust, the networking side of IT, they look at it as zero trust network access. So how do I, how do I provide access to an on-prem resource or how do I protect your access to a, a SaaS-based app? Whereas the, the app folks, they look at it in terms of how do I literally have no trust for those end users that are trying to come in to access these resources? I.e., how do I make sure that you know I, I, I you know validate their identity, validate their device, you know, validate the data they're trying to access, et cetera, et cetera. So so kind of it, it gets interesting when you start to get deeper into it. Um, but you know, zero trust is still a relatively new concept out there in the industry as well, right? I mean, a lot of vendors out there. I mean, it's it's kind of it's kind of marketing speak at this point, unfortunately. But you know, everybody kind of has their own definition. But what's what's important though is how you think about those those core principles in your environment, and and how do you how do you take your organization on that journey, right? And it's there's not an it's not an end state, right? I can't deploy a zero trust solution. Nothing. There is no solution for that, right? It's right. And and you're constantly evolving. And we go back to assume breach. You kind of hit the nail on the head. I, I think Rod, as you had said it, if nobody's behind the wheel monitoring, you know what's what's the point, right? So yeah. so there's a lot to it, I, I guess, is is what I'm trying to say. But yeah, NIST 800-207, If you if you haven't checked it out, definitely check it out. Yeah, you know, if I get into that conversation, I say, well, there are two type of like, camps here to customers, and that's how I like to keep it simple and go complex rather than go complex and then trying to make it simple. You have the two biggest risk groups are IT people, whether it be security, infrastructure, cloud, whatever, because they know better, but they have so much rights. They have so many rights. Then you have the average end user that should know better, but no rights. So you have to figure out what that balance is, right? Because when you look at stuff like which is one of our, um, you know, favorite things that we did on the partner side, I was always a Microsoft Cloud App Security or Microsoft Defender for Cloud Apps fan. Shadow IT is one of those things that is a, that, that can lead to that violation of zero trust and, 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 and believe like that. I, someone asked me, what is the biggest proponent of, sh- of shadow IT? I said budget. People ever go buy their stuff and do whatever they want. 
And yeah. since you and since they can do it, they assume that well, if I can do it, it must be okay for me to do. But the zero trust thing is a is a is is a should be part of your security program and your security yeah. initiative. You're right. You just can't deploy it and walk away because you can have zero trust with one security vendor or 15 security vendors, right? How would you approach it, Matt? And what if, what have you seen just from a Microsoft uh, centric perspective? Yeah. Um, so if, if you look at the Microsoft cybersecurity reference architecture, it's just AK to MS slash MCRA. And we'll put it, we'll put a link in the chat window here for everybody. Um, it's like 60 slides. So, so definitely take your time going through it. But um, if you take a look at that, you'll see maybe 10 or 12 slides on how Microsoft approaches zero trust. And there's one really good slide that talk that, that has the attack chain or the kill chain. And then it shows you, here's the Microsoft products that can help protect against each stage of that, uh, that attack chain. And we look at it from, a, from two different lenses, internal and external. So for internal, it's it's quite easy. It's it's Microsoft Insider Risk Management that's now part of Azure Purview and and all the new exciting announcements. Um, and that's literally looking at signals from those end users, device signals, application signals. There's a lot of data coming in to help understand. Okay, are, are there any users in the environment that pose an internal risk? And we could talk more about what that means. Externally, though, when we think about like a phishing email campaign, there's literally Microsoft products that overlay each stage of that attack chain. So how do they get into the environment? How do they lean and expand? How they exfiltrate data? How they carry out their mission and all that? And so kind of kind of my approach and what I've, and obviously I work at Microsoft, but what I've seen our customers do with the Microsoft tools is they will typically adopt the Microsoft Defender suite of products. And that's usually the starting point. However, I would argue the main starting point is identity. So, you know, it's, it's kind of the age old uh, thing of, I could have the best firewall, but if you have access to my identity, it's game over anyway. I could have the best endpoint detection response solution. It's game over if you have my identity, right? All right. roads, even, so, so to answer your question, like my approach is, let's get identity squared away. Yeah. And then let's branch out from there. Even from my side, from a cyber perspective, right? Um, we can have just the most amazing network engineers in the world that know everything about network security, but it always boils down to bad user habits. It's always about mm -hmm. the user. It's always about that profile or that user account that's going to be that entry point, entryway into the environment. So, so a bonus question for our listeners, either <clears throat> they can chat it or email us. First one we get on, in their communication, who invented the concept kill chain that made it a industry standard? What company? Brody, you don't count. You're probably working with that customer. That's He's looking for exam points. Yeah. Anybody? Anybody? Let's let's give a second. Uh, you watch can win a Microsoft chat. Security Insight gift card. Who gift invented card. the kill train Ooh, concept? Oh, boy. You're pulling out the big bucks now. You know, I didn't say how much it was. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, nobody's come in yet. I do believe it oh, was. Oh, I see it. Lock there it is. Norton Norris, Lockheed, Lockheed, Martin. Lockheed. So Norton, you win a Microsoft Insights gift certificate. We'll figure out how to get it to you. Well, how about a, how about that and a Microsoft Security Insights coffee cup? Ooh. I love those. See, there we go. That's yeah. perfect. And it's, it's all for a good cause. So we'll that's wonderful. That. So, you know. So can I ask a question here? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so when I looked at the SC100, I kind of felt like the security architect should be first and foremost focused on zero trust in combination with compliance. What is your take on that, Matt? That's a that's a great way of looking at it. Um, I would agree. You know, it's so so I used to work in IT before I was at Microsoft. I was an IT admin, if you will, and, a, and an architect at a you know private company. Um, at the end of the day, what really matters to the business is compliance. You know, compliance will drive your IT budget. It will drive what you do from a cybersecurity perspective. Um, so there's those important things, but it's also how do I make sure I, I, I enforce that compliance? So to give you a great example, if you look at uh, industry use cases like financial services, 
there is um, there is regulation that requires you to, you know, if you're a floor trader, making up a scenario here, but if you're a floor trader, you're not allowed to interact with, uh, you know, the other folks in, in the business. Or if you're in a research and development firm, you know, those scientists, they may be kind of firewalled, if you will. They can't, you're not allowed to work with or speak with other folks in the business. So how do you enforce that, right? Um, so there's, there's various uh, customers I've worked with over the years that they've got those business requirements from a, a regulatory perspective that they have to comply with. Otherwise they get fined or, you know, they lose accreditation if they're a university or you know, a number of different bad things happen. So yeah, compliance needs to be a part of it. And, and, you know, I almost would take a kind of a step back, like forget the technology, forget the vendors and all of that. Just what are the requirements? What are you trying to do? Why are you trying to do it? And let's get super, super crisp and clear on that. And, and what is the outcome you're trying to drive? And then once you understand that from that business perspective, and that includes compliance, but once you understand that, then we could start thinking about, okay, what kind of technology do we want to put in here to help us, you know, meet that? Um, Great that's just up. kind of how I, how I look at that. Yeah. It should Somebody come from the top down, that. right? It's yeah. tough. It's tough when it comes to try to, you try to generate that from the bottom up. Oh, let's apply technology because we think it can meet this or that. But we really need to understand those top down business requirements and then apply technology to meet those controls and requirements. Yeah. Great, great call yeah. out, Matt. Sorry, Ed, go ahead. No, no, I'm sorry, but I, it, right, it, I was I with that. a I was with a customer, and I was supporting a salesperson. The salesperson start touting out industry standard. They say zero trust, and so the director or whatever, he might have been a CISO, saying, "Okay, what's zero trust?" And he's, you could tell it was reading, and the guy said, "Don't, don't read me that. What is zero trust?" You know, I was quiet, and, and he said, "Ed, do you know what zero trust is?" I said, "Yes." Everybody's an adversary until they prove themselves otherwise about what they have, what they know, and what they can prove, right? And 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 he's like, all right, that, that makes sense, right? You know, you can take that and extrapolate it anywhere, right? But you are an adversary until you prove that you are not that person, right? Mm. By virtue of what you have, what you know, and what you can prove. Password, username, multi-factor, whether it be a phone thingy or one of these UV things right here, right? <laughs> I got these UV key things, right? So, man, it, it's, so, but let, let me ask you, I, let me ask one more thing. Well, go okay. ahead, Frank, and then uh, I'll, I'll ask this question. I'll write it down so I'll forget. So zero trust. So, what is Microsoft providing? What are the best practices for the uh, OAuth user token situation going on out there that that's like the number one target now for attackers? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. So, so when I said earlier about identity kind of kind of being that foundational layer, uh, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean go out and deploy, you know, some identity provider solution. It means it means how do you verify that it's really Matt coming through the front door, and and then based on that, how do I give him access to various you know resources? So, you know, as a Microsoft employee, just as an example, uh, for me to access my email. I have to have not only my identity needs to be squared away, so I got to satisfy multi-factor authentication requirements. I got to satisfy identity protection requirements to make sure it's really me, and we can come back to that. But I also have to satisfy a requirement that my device is managed and it's compliant. And then if and if I don't meet those things, then I, I don't get access to the front door. And so when we think about how do we verify it's really Matt and how do we do that multi-factor authentication uh, requirement, you got multiple methods, right? Now, some of these methods are more secure than others. Um, what matters is, you know, you're you're looking at adopting these methods broadly, not just for IT, not just for executives, but every user. Um, so going back to your question, though, Frank, about the OAuth tokens, what's interesting about the OAuth token that has like the one-time password, six-digit one-time password on it, it could actually be fished. Mm -hmm. And so, so that changes the game, right? Because for years, decades even, you know, in IT, we, we, that's been kind of gold standard, get an OAuth token, right? Well, times have changed um, and that could actually be fished. And so um, I would say part of the best practices are adopting passwordless. Now nice. we, could, we could talk more about what that means, but passwordless is Windows Hello for Business. It's phone sign-in using the Microsoft Authenticator app. And then it's also using a FIDO2 security key, uh, like a YubiKey, as an example. And now what's interesting about those is it can actually verify you, um, and it can validate it really is you.
But if you go all the way over to the right and you go to that FIDO2 security key, that is, nothing's impossible. But FIDO2 is, is extremely difficult to try to impersonate. So because of the checks and balances that are just part of the protocol. So, so that's kind of the best practices nowadays is how do I adopt password lists across the organization? But I got to crawl, walk, run, right? That's more of the run stage. To get there, we got to make sure that you know, we have some kind of modern, modern identity provider. And we've, we've done the proper configuration, the proper you know, design steps so we can even get to that point. And that's why I mentioned before, like, forget technology. What are you trying to do? Where are you trying to go? You know, what's that end goal? Because there's likely going to be 100 steps. Password list is like number 27. Mm-hmm. You, you know, and so I got I got to kind of figure out, and, and it's and you know it's it's a it's a long pull and a huge tent. <laughs> right? Does does Defender for Cloud Apps or conditional access provide any sort of session management capabilities to help discover that or time people out or anything like that? They can yeah. be done right now, right away for people. Yeah. So what's inter- What I love about Defender for Cloud Apps. Uh, formerly known as Microsoft Cloud Up Security, MCAS. It's okay to say MCAS, by the way. MCAS, yeah, CASB, yeah. right? Uh, what I love about it is that session control and that session monitoring. And so if you if you take your SaaS app, uh, let's say it's Salesforce, as an example. Um, if I'm a contractor, maybe I'm not logging in from a managed device and a compliant device, but, but my, I'm logging in and maybe I have a FIDO2 security key or whatever method. So when I log in, we could do session control on you. So I could let you into Salesforce. I can let you view the data, but maybe I want to block your ability to download because you're not on a trusted and compliant device. Right. And and that opens up a whole new set of outcomes and possibilities. And again, that's what I'm what I'm getting to. Like, what's the business outcomes? Think about it. If I let a contractor do that, that enables all sorts of new possibilities for the business. If, if we go back to the pandemic for just a moment. I mean, we're kind of still in the pandemic, but we'll go back to the early stages when it first started, companies were sending people home. Well, uh, my phone was ringing off the hook because a lot of our customers out there that I work with, they've never sent people home before. How do we do mm-hmm. this, right? And people are like wanting to go out and buy their own PC or Mac or iPad or whatever. They want to load all this corporate data onto it. That's a huge risk. And so that's where MCAS to the rescue and session control and and say, say, that, to, say that last yeah. thing one more time. Who to the rescue? Yeah. <laughs> Defender for cloud apps. <laughs> there you go. Defender for cloud apps and MCAS <laughs> to the rescue. Yeah. There you go. Uh, so anyway, yeah, it. so so such control is huge. Yeah, love it. Well, I yeah, so I just joined Microsoft, thanks to Matt Sozman, uh, just over a year ago, and I love working in a passwordless environment day mm-hmm. in and day out. It just makes sense. I had to get a replacement device recently, and that's the first time I've had to put my password into anything in close to a year. And day in and day out, it just feels right. I prefer the pen over the face because I never know what position I'm in when I'm coming up to the computer, but it, it's just peace of mind. And then you can adopt that same thing right now on consumer accounts like my Outlook account and my Xbox account. It's all passwordless. I'm not trying to type in my password on my buddy's Xbox when I'm over there. It's just an MFA check and you're in, right? Same thing mm-hmm. for everything at work. If you're coming from a weird location, you might get an MFA check, but if you're in that on that uh, device that you're normally logging into from that location that you're normally logging into at that time of day, you're normally logging into it. It's just pattern recognition, behavioral analysis, making those determinations on whether or not you should be allowed in. And that just, that's, that's the future. That's the journey that we all need to get on and help our customers with. So, so Brody, I Matt, just have me... to ask, have you ever backed into your computer and, and it logged you in? Uh, yeah, I have. Well, I have pants that have my face on them. So okay. it works yeah, sometimes. I was just worried about yeah. that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. but there you go. <laughs> so this this is a question. I'll I'll, I'll target it at, at, at Matt, but anybody can answer. So you were talking about passwordless, and we also talked about multi-factor authentication, MFA. Are they mutually inclusive or exclusive of each other? Or are they just two sides of the same coin? It depends on how you look at it. Mm-hmm. There's 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 some schools of thought that it's it's just another factor of authentication. There's other schools of thought is that it's it's truly passwordless. Um, it it kind of depends on again on how you how you look at it. You know, I'll give you a great example though, and, and how I work. Um, I've got a Surface, obviously, but I use Windows Hello for business every day. I turn it on. Brody was talking about this. I turn on, it sees my face. 
or I could type in that pen. But because it's joined Azure Active Directory, or even hybrid joined, it's single sign-on for the rest of the, the rest of the experience, with the exception of a few apps, maybe legacy apps. But most of the things I access every day, I don't have to log into. So that was a passwordless experience. I never had to type in a password. It used my face. Um, and it's actually two-factor as well, because there's a TPM chip inside the computer mm -hmm. that houses a certificate. And that facial recognition, obviously, it's something I, I, I have. And uh, the, the cert is something I know. And so it actually unlocks that that TPM chip so it could access the cert. So, but that's a great experience because then it's single sign-on for the rest of the session. Um, but I'd be curious to see what others think about that. Again, it kind of depends on on what your definition is and, and kind of who you ask. You would think in 2022 that we wouldn't still be talking about you need to use MFA. I know <laughs> I've seen studies and I do this stuff. What what do yeah. you think is still the major re and this is just not SMBs. Everybody likes to say the numbers are skewed because SMBs are not adopting this. I've been in enterprises. I'm with one right now and it's tough. What, yeah. I'll let Matt answer the question. Yeah. What's the biggest rub for people not adopting some form of it? You know, in my experience, what I've seen it's 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 a few things. Um, when it comes down to using, say, the Microsoft Authenticator app or any Authenticator app, it could be any but any vendor. Um, your average employee, they do not want that installed on their personal device. Hmm. Pardon me, I can't blame them, <clears throat> right? Because because sure. to them, they're not in IT, they don't understand how it really works. They think, oh, I install this work-related app, maybe my employer or somebody can can look at my personal device. That's often a, a point of contention. So that's that's kind of number one. Number two is legacy apps. There's mm -hmm. a lot of, of technical debt out there that that organizations still have. And so, so being able to get those legacy apps to work with modern authentication that supports MFA can often be a, a challenge. Now, obviously there's solutions out there. Microsoft has them, third party has them to help with that, but that's that's typically a point of contention. And then the third one is uh, is cost, right? So obviously deploying the Authenticator app to a mobile device, that's that's free if the employee lets you do it. Uh, buying a FIDO2 key, there's a cost associated with that. And then having a piece of hardware that supports Windows Hello for business. Not Well, actually just Windows Hello, right? Now to Brody's point, you can use the pen, uh, but also just having that computer that has that TPM chip and then doing all the backend work to have the for business part configured properly. Um, that's usually what I see. You know, but but when you look at the, the breach reports out there in the industry, look at the Microsoft breach reports, Verizon, name the tech company that, that publishes these things, the root cause of these breaches often fall back to identity related incidents where the password was compromised. Mm -hmm. you, know, it drives, you, know, uh, you know, it drives me crazy about MFA and conditional access. They're like they're like, okay, if you're at a known location with inside our network then you don't actually have to do MFA. Right. I, I hate that known or safe location <laughs> or network location thing. It should just be removed because that goes against assumed breach. Trust. So it drives me crazy. Yeah, yeah absolutely right. Because castle on mode mindset, know. right? Well, we're over we're here. We're in the perimeter. We're safe. It's all good. Give them all the access. Mm -hmm. No checks. Doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah you're right. That's a, good, that's a good point, Frank, because, you know, trying to determine what is safe and what is not safe, especially if you start looking at, you know, geographic boundaries, workplaces, this whole pandemic thing has totally flipped it. How do I do this? But, I don't want people to think that I'm on the COVID side. It was a necessary yeah. evil. It yeah. made everyone think about things differently because your building is not safe for me. I'm one of the best social engineers out there. You know, <laughs> from delivering pizzas to delivering UPS boxes, I can get in. And you'd be surprised our customers don't, don't have any type of knack uh, anything you can just stand up a wireless access point man in the middle pineapple to death i mean frank you and i talked about this so right. but yeah. I, I mean i i gotta tell you I, I do a lot of sc200 skills verification sort of work and i don't even include mfa in it mm. that sounds strange right because i'm like if you're at the sc200 level and you're not and you don't know about MFA and the implementation of MFA, you know, go, you know, go back to, uh, you know, take a step back, right? I mean, at, at that point, SC200, you should be completely aware of MFA and how important it is and so on. So I don't even bother with the skills verification of MFA 
just because of that. It sounds strange, but it's like this is you know this is step one of uh, of what you should actually be doing. The 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 low hanging fruit, easy thing to do, make it happen. That's why the exam numbers don't just drive me batty. Because SE three hundred, the learn module in that exam, right? That's where all the identity stuff comes in. Yeah. Yeah. Or so you're saying like the order of the numbers. Yeah. 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 It's kind of funny yeah. how that works. It, it's a good foundational thing, right? In, in getting squared away in identity. But but you know, the, the other thing too is like MFA is not the not the fix all. Nothing is. But you want to have, you know, in the industry we call it defense in depth or layer defense. You know, how do we and again, nothing's impossible to to hack. If if they want in, they're gonna find a way to get in. Just listen to some of these podcasts out there where they actually interview social engineers that get into act, get into buildings. Some of these are government buildings, banks. They will find a way in if they really want to. But defense in depth, right? So so okay, I'm using MFA. What's my next level? What's my next barrier in place? Well, if you get access to my identity, but you're on that managed endpoint, and remember my my zero trust policy says you can't access a resource unless the device is managed. So if you somehow get access to my identity, that next barrier is that endpoint. Okay, what do I do next? Right? How do I protect that endpoint? How do I how do I you know minimize that attacker's ability to move laterally or move outside my device and onto another device? But then if they compromise that, what's the next layer? And you keep going, you keep going, you keep going. Right. And, the cost. But all of that has to be backed up by monitoring. Somebody has to be behind the wheel monitoring all of that. And what, what gets super interesting is when you have different point solutions from different vendors <clears throat> that are along that entire attack chain, that requires a lot of specialized skills, which means gaps in visibility. So that, that's all kind of debatable, right? But it's interesting though, you, you just, you can't, invest 100% in one solution, you do have to have that layers, like wedding cake, right? You got to have multiple layers here to make sure you're protected. The seven but layer party of depth of yeah. security. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. but one but one of the things about having depth and security, and I'm a fan of it, and, I, and this is going to lead to a, a second part of this question. The more depth sends to exacerbate the problem that it wears out the security people that you have, and then uh, industries, there's still a huge lack of. It's one of the few times that when you hear reports about that there's not enough workers for a particular industry, and our industry is true. It really is. Verifiable, especially senior level, and then when you finally get someone like us, you burn us out. And 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 it is one of the things, if you thought playing cornerback in the NFL was bad, think about being a SOC analyst or someone that has to protect your environment when a team of four people can outwit your entire department. <laughs> and they're wearing on you, right? And 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 you won't invest in the tools. You won't do these things. So, you know, it's, it's... Uh, there, there was there was a comment in our uh, chat. So uh, from Reprise ninety nine, large enterprises can also get caught up in trying to be perfect. And if MFA or a passwordless, or whatever technology doesn't cover every use case, so it never gets off the ground even though deploying MFA or conditional access or whatever, even across some workloads is still a significant risk reduction. So, you know, I agree with them because one of the things that we haven't talked about here is, you know, the, the risk management side here, deciding, you know, where your risks are and, and putting that into the, the overall uh, formula here, uh, what you should be going after. So I think that that's a, a great point. They're trying to make it perfect without looking at what their risk is and is this reducing their risk uh, immediately and, and then going after those high risk areas. Frank, that's a really good point. Um, and maybe just a quick comment on that. Uh, you, you almost want to think about, not necessarily think, you want to do, but you want to go out and discover what kind of data actually exists. Now, that's easier said than, said than done, obviously. But going out and do a discovery of the data across the entire organization and understand what kind of data is it. Doing that will help you really understand what kind of risk you're at. It'll help you measure that on that, on that meter. So for example, if I have a bunch of PII data sitting in HR or a bunch of customer PII data sitting with my sales team or customer service team, that's a problem. So, that I, so I need to figure out how do I protect that and how do I apply these multiple, multiple layers to it. But then if I have a bunch of um, engineering type data that has my intellectual property in it, well, what do these attackers want? They usually want the financial data or they want the intellectual property. 
And so you, you want to kind of think through, how do I go out and discover that data? And there's tools out there in the market. Microsoft has tools as well to do that, but discover that data. And then once I discover it, I want to classify it. So think of like the government, you know, top secret, secret, confidential, but then based on a classification, govern access to it. So if, if I'm trying to access top secret data, well, I got to be on a managed device. It also has to be compliant with all my IT policies. My identity has to be squared away. Maybe I have to have all these other checks and balances in place. But then maybe if it's uh, the lowest classification, maybe confidential, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe not as much. And, you know, and, and Brody, I know you do a lot with, with Microsoft information protection and, and, and the, the purview suite now, uh -huh. but that's a key benefit of MIP is being able to discover data, classify data, but then it encrypts it. So if I send you a spreadsheet and you sent everybody on this meeting, they won't be able to open it. That's right. encrypted. Right. It follows the document regardless of where it lies. And even if you make it past all of your defense in depth layers across the kill chain brought to you by Lockheed, uh, you know, that encryption, that rights management persists with the document outside. You know, if it ends up being into bad cloudstorage.com, some sort of breach incident using the latest encryption standards. We were just talking with Michael Howard on this last week. It's, you know, there's today the encryption standards that we use to manage that rights management and that encryption it's not something that can be broken today with general with our computing power outside of you know if we have a, a, a decepticon with a quantum computer somewhere in the world maybe they can do it but but yeah you're right man that's that's important that's important for people to understand and the different policies that go behind yeah. that encryption right to your point let's introduce checks and balances or for highly confidential but you know less so for maybe public uh, label documents so it's a it's a journey definitely yeah, well, just a quick I, comment, I, then I'll, I'll pause for a second. So just a quick comment on that. You reminded me of a quick story, um, you know, anonymous, of course, but I once met an organization that went through a data breach because they were they had a shadow IT problem and they were storing what could be considered confidential data in a public SaaS app that IT had no no visibility to. And so so it's you know it also comes down to and Ed kind of opened up the conversation with this, it comes down to also shadow IT, discovering the apps that are out there in the environment, who's using what, how are they using it, and applying policy. We don't want to take that, we don't want to take the freedoms away from end users. We just want to be able to extend IT security policy to it. And that's kind of the benefit of the Microsoft suite is if you want to use Salesforce or Dropbox, great, we could do that. Let's extend some of that, that safety to it. Anyway, sorry, Ed, I, I know you're about to jump in. You know, one, one, of the, one of the things that made you and I stand out on our team, because you and I never vilified the end user. We never made them seem like they were a liability. We made them heroes. Yeah. And when you make them feel part of the security program, they're much more likely to submit stuff without fear of, of, of retribution or being, you know, shamed or being <laughs> reprimanded. Like, ooh. I clicked on this link. I need to tell someone, right? Rather than I click on this link, I'm not telling anyone because I want to keep my job, right? And so I think that whomever is the mouthpiece, mouthpiece of security needs to be able to have better relationship building skills because there is a misconception that security organizations or the security entity organization runs the ship. They do not. The business of the business runs the ship. Right. And, and so you have to go in and build partnerships. And that's what I'm seeing a lack of across not just Microsoft, all vendors. They just want to sell you something, right? Instead of saying, what problems you got? Blah, 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 blah. I tell you, uh, industry, for the most part, it has it together. And you very rarely see breaches because they do everything you talked about. They've been doing zero trust for years. They've been doing, no, you don't get to bring your own device pharmaceuticals because they have valued their intellectual property right and they know if we lose this or this gets leaked out this has the potential to cost us <clears throat> millions if not billions i used to work in the farmer industry you're talking about shakedown scan you you don't use anybody laptop but mine you don't get your phone we supply you with the device all the way down and they have some of the best data protection you'll ever see right uh, I, I think that the other thing we have to do is we have to lessen the load and Frank make this point. It doesn't have to be all or nothing, right? You got to have some, right? I had a customer that wants to to do a MDI um, PLC 
and they're worried about, hey, how, you know, this is going to be really heavy lift because they, they had a lot of domain control, a lot. I said, that's fine. We're just doing a proof of value. Let's get it on a couple. Well, I'm going to have blind spots. Yeah, you are. But unless that person is extremely skilled, they're not going to know what's on that particular domain control and they're going to make a mistake. Right. When they start doing subnet queries, they start doing LDAP binds, they start looking at your directory structure, they're going to tip off the, rain, the wrong domain controller. Now, who's watching that? Who knows? Because <laughs> everybody's burnt out. Brody's, Brody's work 15 hours a day. Um, not quite. You know, Brody's work 10 hours a day. And two of those hours, we're looking for a new gig because he's burnt out. Right. <laughs> I like I like my gig. I hear you. I hear you, man. I told a joke one time, Matt and I. Um, we were we were doing a trifecta event, and I told the customer, I said, uh, you know, you may have a attrition problem. Why? Well, between eleven and two, you seem to have a whole lot of dice, career builder. <laughs> LinkedIn job search going on in your environment, right? So not only are you looking for nefarious behavior, you can look at trends, not really spying on anybody, but there's so many things that you can do that will enhance. And I think security advisorship, not vendorship, is the key to doing it, showing people it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Come on, let's let's build this together. And I think I said this on the show, there are three things you need to do with a customer for security. Transparency, trust, and partnership. If you can get those three, they'll share their data laundry. They'll show you their liabilities. They'll show you their shortcomings. They'll show you whether they're insufficient. And they'll say, we're partners, right? Right, right. Help me fix this, right? And part of the fix is um, we got we got to sort of come to a, a conclusion of we got to figure out how to make one size fits many. One size will never fit all. It just will not. But we got to get more closer to the target of one size fits a lot. But this, I, I, I'm a Microsoft, you know, advocate, I'm a Microsoft fanboy, but stuff ain't cheap. And our competition stuff is not cheap. It's just not in the SMBs or the proving grounds for a lot of this. I won't even go into the latest CVE that's out right now. I'm, I'm sure you guys have heard about it, but this is our PC thing. And mm -hmm. I, 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 I <clears throat> it is it is deadly serious. As soon as someone figure out how to use it, and they said it may be one of the worst ones since we had this wanna cry. <laughs> I'm like, oh, all right, all right Brody, here? Brody, you had your hand up. So, what's your question? Oh, Brody has hand up. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, it was, we don't, once you're off your soapbox, you okay. have to you have to use the the back scratcher to. Oh, yeah, the, the, you, the back the back scratcher. Scratcher. When, you can't raise your hand. You have to raise the back scratcher. <laughs> oh my gosh, Frank's the only guy who doesn't have one. Yeah, we'll we'll have to get some. Uh, I we'll have to get oh, some we'll podcasts, you one, back right? scratchers. Yeah, there you go. So, so Matt Sozman, a little bit of a curveball, but identity related. Do you get to work at all with the decentralized identity initiative that Microsoft is working on these days, and how that relates to protecting and, and giving yeah. ownership over security? You know, go ahead. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, yeah. Um, so I, I don't, I don't go too deep into it right now, because um, it's it's still kind of a, a rather new thing. But yeah, Microsoft does have some some plans there and in fact i need to go find the the link or unless one of you are fast in this uh we did some blogs on tech community i think just a month ago or two months ago uh pam dingle from our identity engineering team uh, she did publish some blogs along with alex weiner and alex si simons on decentralized identity it's super fascinating stuff yeah. and and i and i believe that's going to be that's going to be a big deal because that goes back to what we were talking about before and verify explicitly. That's a that's a great way to do that. Um, and but also kind of be decentralized and not have to rely on a single IDP. So so yeah, it's it's uh it's something that's definitely on the horizon. I think the industry is starting to think about and Microsoft's right there along with it. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, I, yeah. I think it's also an extremely interesting technology, not only for Microsoft, but society, right? Everybody having their own decentralized digital identity just makes sense for so many different reasons I could talk about for for hours and hours so that's that's cool that you get your that you're close to that and we will add that to the show notes because I think everybody else yeah. needs to learn a little bit more about that yeah and, and just maybe a, a quick comment I I, I want to just maybe mention so I, I think it was Ed that that maybe alluded to it earlier um 
know, there's organizations out there, they don't have all their eggs in one basket, obviously, right? So they're using various security tools from, from various vendors. It's going to be more of a hetero, heterogeneous mixture in that architecture. Um, you know, as an industry, we, we do need to push forward for how do we interoperate mm. between heterogeneous solutions, right? So how does solution A from solution vendor A talk to solution B from solution vendor B? We need those open standards. We need those um, those APIs to exist so that these different security solutions can talk to each other so you don't have gaps in visibility, right? Because we're only humans. While we could be behind the wheel, we can't look at everything. And I, I can't pay somebody to look at event logs all day. That, that won't get me anywhere. But we do need to be able to just spot that needle in the haystack using technology, in other words, AI, right, machine learning, yeah. to do that. But we need to have, make sure that data is there. So pushing for those open standards and having those APIs available can really benefit that organization who, who chooses to have that heterogeneous architecture, if that makes sense. It, it, it does. I think that is a tall glass of water. It is. Because right now, the way that we're achieving that, we, not us, unless we're billionaire IT security companies, is, is it, it is a flawed method because profit is the thing. Here's how they do it. Acquisitions. That's it. We'll acquire mm -hmm. that other widget and build it into our own. And But that's not true in operability. That is competition reduction by bringing in something that you don't have time to build or is just a superior product. So rather than go out and try to get interoperability and allow that particular security entity to exist, you acquire them. And we know how acquire, you know acquisitions go, right? Right. It, it's, that, is a, that is a tall water when you have to you have to bump against shareholders, this intellectual property. <clears throat> and, it, and But there are examples of doing it, open source stuff. But when you go look at open source, it's generally synonymous with no revenue generation. Yep. Yeah, we, just as an industry, we, we just need to get better at it, right? Because because I've seen some organizations out there I've worked with where they're, they're SOC analysts, they've been trained on vendor A, that's all they know. Yeah, and then all of a sudden the, the the business introduces another vendor. You're going to have gaps in visibility if you don't get people trained, and that's expensive. Let alone well, it's, a, it's a training thing, but also the tools don't talk to each other, right? Bingo. So yeah, so you have to we hire more tools people for every tool. Yeah. Right. So we we need those tools to talk to each other, and so so Microsoft has done some some great work around uh, around getting APIs for our security platform. Yeah. Uh, out there and, and published, so that's all that's all out there on Docs, and I'll see if I can find a link here, but. Um, but, you know, as an industry, though, I think we just need to get better at that and, and, and help those defenders, you know, actually catch this needle in the haystack when they're using these heterogeneous architectures. Anyway, but, I digress. No, but I think I, I think you're right, because um, that's probably one of the biggest, even though Zero Trust has been around for a while, it's still early days for a lot of organizations with Zero Trust. A lot of companies and customers I talk to and I say this whole zero trust thing, I have to explain it to them, the different pillars, all identity, devices, apps, all this stuff. And then how what our approach is, because we kind of take that model and then we apply whatever our defender product is against that. We have that coverage, but we still have some gaps from a partner perspective. That's why we rely so heavily on a lot of our partners. From the platform. Rob, that's, that's a, a great good, point. That's a good pivot. Partners. Yep. yep. So let's talk about that for a second. I'll, I'll kind of give you my perspective. I've been in the partner world for probably five years now at Microsoft. And, you know, when you, when you, it's kind of like tel telco, right? Back in the day, you, you know, that last mile is the customers, you know, on-premise equipment um, that they're responsible for. It, it's kind of the same thing here, but I want to go back to what I talked about in the beginning. You know, what are you trying to do? Why are you trying to do it? What's those outcomes you're trying to achieve? And so, you know, Microsoft, we may have a solution that helps you achieve 100% of that. We may have a solution that helps you achieve 80% of it. Just everybody's different, right? So for that remaining 20%, what do we do? Well, that's where Microsoft has a, a vast ecosystem of technology partners that have gone out and, and, and performed these integrations with these APIs that we have across our security platform to extend it. So to give you give you some great examples, you know, going back to that Microsoft Information Protection MIP uh, scenario, I've met some companies out there that they are engineering firms. They need to be able to apply classification and encryption to like an AutoCAD drawing. There's ISVs out there, technology partners that have created 
a solution using our APIs and our SDKs to protect AutoCAD drawings. Um, you know, it's just everywhere you look around Microsoft's ecosystem, we've, we've got technology partners, there's thousands of them that have extended that. And so, so I think there's a lot to be said about that, where if a customer has very unique requirements, combining that better together story with Microsoft plus that, that technology partner solution can, can help you get there. The other side of that, and Frank, this is kind of in your world, but the other side is those system integrators. Mm -hmm. So going back to what are you trying to do? Why are you trying to do it? The business outcomes. If you're an IT at an organization, you may, you may not know how to get to that conclusion. You may need help getting to that conclusion. That's where our consulting partners and these consulting firms and these system integrators out there, they can help do those, that advisory, that, that hardcore consulting to help you understand, okay, here's my business priorities. Here's how I should think about this. Okay, now let's help you design that architecture. Let's make sure we adhere to best practices and so on and so forth. So, so there's there's no shame in getting help, right? But, but I but I think that that partner ecosystem that Microsoft has it plays a critical role in all of this because every organization, every customer out there, they're going to have different requirements, and 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 a square peg is almost always going to go into a round hole. So we need some kind of an adapter, and that's where the partner ecosystem comes in. Yeah, well, and, and and the partner ecosystem is right for those who want to come in and really stamp their name because you've seen a lot of legacy Microsoft partners, large LSEs who are trying to retrofit themselves to become security players, and a lot of them don't have genuine interest in doing it or give, in giving genuine effort. But these startups and these companies that wouldn't really in bed with any type of OEM, this is prime for them to be able to do this. You know, I had the same conversation where someone made the argument I hadn't heard in years. Well, I don't want to put all my eggs in one basket with one particular vendor. So you prefer vulnerability through complexity, you know, because everybody's going to they want to com, com, they want to have a complete portfolio to help you meet as many security challenges as you have. So I, I gave an analogy. I was like, do you think it's easier for me to take these 15 eggs in one? And I'm one person or 15 eggs across 15 different nests and I'm one person. How do you do it, right? So I, I do believe that there is validation for trying to consolidate and reduce your security complexity. Because you can become so secure that you're just super vulnerable. You know, you can put all this stuff in. And when I hear someone go, oh, best of breed, best of breed, here we go again. You know, best of Classic. You know, yeah, best practices. There are no best practices right that is proof of use and proof of value there you go and you figure out what meets your stuff but partners are something that we probably need to have a, a separate show on because yeah, they are critical yeah. it doesn't have to be a microsoft partner it has to be somebody that can help show up your security operations team right um you know the, the easy answer used to be oh i'll just get an mssp that's not that's when do they become you when they take on so many customers now they have become you they're overwhelmed right mm, so you gotta yeah. you gotta you gotta figure it out and i don't know what the answer is uh maybe frank knows <clears throat> it, but i don't know what the answer is right um you know as, as we get ready to pivot and we're, we're talking about some different stuff we talked about zero trust we talked about uh, passwordless. We talked about partners. Is there anything else that, like Matt, if I said, give me the top two things that you can do right now, you know, and I'm gonna give you two scenarios. Other than MFA. <laughs> Other than MFA, you can't say MFA. You can't okay. say Pat Wireless. You already put that out there. Give me yep. two more things, and here are the two. Here's I want the two answers on me side. If you're an all up Microsoft security shop, give me two things that you can do. Right. And that's assume and I say all up, that means that you're using Azure and you're using E5 SKU all up. And a purview. <laughs> and if you're not, so let's go. If I'm a customer, I'm all E5 up. Give me two things I can do. All right. So so the first one that comes to mind, and I, I alluded to it before, instead of risk management. Compliance to Microsoft.com website, boom, instead of risk management. Get that set up and configured. That's going to pull in all the signals across all employees, what they're doing. Um that's going to give you amazing insights. The reason why is not just that nefarious employee, but if but if an attacker, a bad guy actually makes it through, they're going to be doing a bunch of unnatural behavior. Insider risk management will help you identify it. It's using machine learning and all sorts of advanced technology to do that. The second one 
that comes to mind is don't forget about the endpoint, whether it's a server or a laptop or a mobile device, don't forget about it. Let's secure those endpoints. Mm -hmm. Let's use Intune. Let's get IT policy out to them, encrypt them, set a passcode. Even if it's all zeros, just something. Actually, <laughs> don't do that. But just something <laughs> that, that gets out there to secure that endpoint. EDR, right? Microsoft <clears throat> Defender for endpoint. But do it for your servers, too. Consider what's going on in Azure, right? We got Sentinel out there watching the Azure environment. But how are we protecting those servers, right? So, so you know, protect your endpoint and then look for insider risk. I think you'll find insider risk management is, is hugely beneficial. Now, it's it, you're going to have to set it up, and it's... You know, there's some configuration required, but man, once you get that under control and you start looking at that data, that that can be life changing. So that, that's kind of my opinion, and going beyond password lists and beyond identity. Yeah, I, is insider risk I, is, is insider risk management compliance or security? Hmm. I, I think it's compliance. Microsoft.com. I think it's. Compliance. I know, I know, I know where it's located, but to oh. you, is it security or is it compliance? Yeah, I don't know, guys. That's a tough one. I kind of, I kind of. <laughs> Stump Matt Sozman, nice job. Yeah, I go, yeah. I go across. I mean, I, I'm kind of straddling the line here on that one. Um, I guess it depends on how you how you think about it. Like, you can set up groups within Insider Risk Management to to monitor specific people, and that's where communications compliance comes in too. Right. Like that's even cooler, right? So I can look for keywords to see if somebody's talking about insider trading or whatever. Um, so I guess it can go between both, but. Um, if you haven't checked it out, check it out. I, I, you know, I think it's, I, I think that, I think it's worth the, uh, worth the time. <laughs> and I, I give you a joke. Yeah. On the customer call, salesperson asked me to come help out. We, they were trying to get the customer to adopt inside a risk. They had, they had purchased it, E5 and the other SKU, the premium. I think they're starting to charge for it now. And he said, Yeah, it's a heavy lift plus. You know, I'm trying to get most bang for my buck. It's inside a risk. That doesn't help me against external threats. Sir, if someone breaches your environment and they're on the, where are they? They're on the inside. <laughs> can, <laughs> but, and, can I add and, a and, third one? <laughs> Sorry. Can I add, yes, I just can. want to add a third one. Defender for identity. Love like it. Like for me, that is very, yeah. dare I say, low hanging fruit. Totally. Yeah, if it's, I still, if I have an Active Directory environment, which most organizations have an Active Directory Windows Server Active Directory environment. <laughs> that is like the easiest thing to set up. Now you got to tune it a little bit if you got service accounts and stuff. You get, there's a little bit of tuning, but once you get that set up and, and ready to go, that can provide huge value. Huge, huge value. It, it is one of the things that doesn't require a lot of lift. Just change control, convincing the server admins that hey, this this sensor is not going to kill the authentication and kill your domain control and your DNS. And once it's in, you hope you never hear anything. I don't want to hear anything coming out of this, right? Uh, it is it is definitely one of my favorite products now because of ease of deployment and bang for the buck or perceived bang for the buck. Because like I said, I've gone into <clears throat> one out of five customers that I've helped put it in, they stopped the PLC because they discovered something. <laughs> They're um, like, well. time out. You know, we now we need to get some other people in here <laughs> to see about this, right? And sometimes it's benign and lack of an indeliberate because of insider risk. Unfortunately, some of them have been external risk that became insider risk. Because once I'm on the inside, I'm insider risk, right? Man, but yeah, it's it, there are tools out there. You know, we yeah. are the Microsoft Security Insights Podcast, so we're going to tout and promote the things that we are good at and skill. But we tell all our listeners and all our, our folks out in the field, use something. Use something. Yeah, don't, don't, you absolutely. And, yeah, because because the bad guys are not going to pass you by. <clears throat> oh, I'm too small. Oh, I don't do this and that. Nah, nah. You 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 a prime target. Yeah, we got we got to get you right. Uh, what so else would you like? Yeah, yeah we're we're actually real close to to wrapping up, and I think we kind of need to to get to yeah. that point. Um, did have a few things though that kind of want to wind down with uh, number one, just absolutely appreciate Matt being here. I always love listening to Matt talk about things. He absolutely makes me smarter. Um, so I, I'm, I'm actually going to go, you know, talk to the wife tonight and she's not even going to know what I'm talking about at all, which is absolutely awesome. I, I love a lot of my own TV shows and do everything that I want to do. Now. 
So Matt, a lot of comments in our uh, chat here are saying they learned so much from you and the videos oh, that you, you put out on YouTube. So uh, well, I wish you. you could see all those uh, those chats out there. Yeah, great yeah, job, he, Matt. He is. He, he makes Rod smarter. He makes me feel dumb. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, for having guys. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, for sure. This is awesome. Also, I, I do want to mention, since this is our first time on Microsoft Reactor, I think this is super awesome. I really appreciate uh, this opportunity, and I think we all kind of do. But for those that are brand new to us and our kind of style of talk and chat and podcasting and stuff like this, this is actually episode 98, right? First one on Microsoft Reactor, which I think is absolutely awesome that we had Matt on talking about, of all things, identity, which is the first pillar of Zero Trust. This is our first episode um, on Microsoft Reactor, but this is actually episode 98 of Microsoft Security Insights podcast. Uh, it was shared earlier, the link, but you know you can go out to MicrosoftSecurityInsights.com, check out all the previous. And we actually do this every single Wednesday evening at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Right. Um, I think, Frank, the the audio version of the podcast goes out on Mondays or something the following Monday. Uh, so everybody can listen to it wherever they listen to podcasts. But it's I think it's important to understand that we're going to be doing this one once a month. Our next scheduled Microsoft Reactor show is May 25th with our buddy Jing. He's actually coming back. I held this up earlier. Uh, infrastructure is code with Azure Bicep. Keep this in mind, Azure Bicep with Microsoft Sentinel. We may actually talk about this on May 25th with Jing. So there's that. Also, I just want to tell the Microsoft Reactor folks how appreciative I am of this opportunity. Um, and, and I do want to share my screen for just a second. Let's make sure that that looks the way it's supposed to. We talked about identity all night. Right. We talked about the zero trust and that first pillar of identity. Uh, we had a link to this a little bit earlier in the show. SC 300. It's an exam for the identity. I mentioned you heard me say earlier, it drives me batty how these are numbered. They're not really consecutive. Um, but at the same time, there is an entire learning path for SC 300 that. If you do it right, it's going to take probably five or six hours to get through, you know, like me, I, I like to kind of hurry and do things. It's going to take me a lot less time. But, you know, if you do it right and you want to accumulate that knowledge, it's like you go down this path. It's going to be you're going to learn just as much as if you lift, listen to Matt Sosman. So hopefully one of these days we can talk him into actually reading through this thing. It'd be like bedtime stories for us, which would mm -hmm. actually be super awesome. But go check out this learning path. Identity is absolutely important. Everything we talked about, we didn't go big time in depth. But if you go through this, you're going to understand literally everything. So that's that. That's it is for it, me. Is it is it me or my perceiving a false pattern? It seems like the SC exams seem to get harder when the number is lower. <laughs> you can so it, uh, it seems like all the exams seem harder as you get lower in the number. So the nine hundreds are easy to the five hundreds and the two hundreds and the one hundreds, right? Oh. It's, so one, one of the things I want to add about the SC300 exam, just like all the exams out there, the SC300 exam, you have the learning modules that you're going out there doing that. Also, if you go out to uh, GitHub and look up SC300 Microsoft Learn, uh, you'll actually get all of the uh, labs that go along with the SC300 side, and you can work your way uh, through that in your environment. All right. Ed? Well, thanks to our listeners for coming on to our first reactor show. I believe it was a success. I think those that are getting used to us probably know that you're not being rude when we're looking left and right because we're either in the YouTube or we're in the Discord or we're in, in this chat. But this has been extremely enlightening. I like being able to talk tech, but there are immediate applications that someone can take, the, you know, little tidbits. So the next show is coming on uh, May 25th. Uh, but as Rod said, don't sleep on our weekly podcast. We 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 love to share knowledge. We love comments. Join our Discord. Uh, we do answer. Um, we do help. We do like to have career advancement among our uh, our listeners and supporters. And you know, we know we're doing the good work when those have said, "Hey, I passed the certification because I'm listening to your guys' show. I got this job because I did this." Or, man, I could not figure out how to solve this problem until I listened to you guys' episode so and so. So uh, we're doing it because we like doing it, right? 
Uh, and uh, anybody that has suggestions for the shows, uh, we'll share sometime or another a way that we can have a, um, a community inbox. I think we need a community inbox, don't we? We don't have one yet. That would be Brody's actual inbox. We'll just share Brody. his email address. Yeah, Perfect. we'll show Brody's email address out. We'll do a love email. Thank you. Where well, Matt, I appreciate you, sir. You've always been accommodating, man. I enjoy working when you're there. I know you're doing great things. At any time you want to come on the show without invitation, you're more than welcome. I'm sure we can find uh, opportunities for you to host a show when someone's taking vacation or doing something else. Or if you just want to do it, just come on board and do it. Your friend of the well, show, thanks, brother. Thanks for having me. And, and to the audience out there, uh, you know, thanks for spending your time with us. I know it's valuable. So really appreciate it. Yep. Time is the most undervalued currency on the planet. There you go. All until right. Until week. next week. Take care, everyone. Same bat time, same bat channel. All right. Take care. Edward. Take care. Oh, by the way, Frank, uh, we need to get like an ending audio thing for our podcast. Mm-hmm.